Hello, and welcome to With Love and Rage from Extinction Rebellion NYC. My name is Nan, and you're about to hear my interview with Rebecca Orison, an XR member who's getting her PhD in atmospheric and climate science. In our conversation, we talk about the intersection of science and activism. Thanks for tuning in. I just want to start, Rebecca, by thanking you so much for being willing to come on to our podcast. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you and and talk to you about these issues. Great. So you're a climate scientist, you're a grad student, you're getting your PhD. Could you tell us a little bit about Mm -hmm. what you're studying in your research? Yeah, certainly. So the program that I'm in, it's an atmospheric science program. So I'll be getting a doctorate in atmospheric sciences, but I'm studying South American climate variability. And I'm looking at the last 1000 years of the climate and how it's varied in time and space and comparing some of these natural archives that we have to climate models. So it's a kind of intersection between the paleoclimate evidence, as we call it, and some of the theory that we might be able to think about in our climate system from the modeling perspective. Oh, that sounds really interesting. It's a long time frame that you're looking at. Where do you get the Paleolithic data from? Yeah, it's a good question. So there are a variety of different types of archives in the natural world, as we call them. And the archives are, the ones that I'm working with are speleothem data. So this is data that's found in caves from different stalagmite formations. And these are layers of calcite. And I'm also looking at an ice core that came from a tropical glacier in Peru and a lake sediment core that also came from a lake in Peru. Cool. I'm looking at these natural archives to look at sort of the history of rainfall in South America. I got it. Interesting. So my natural next question would be, is climate change part of your research? Yeah, it is and it isn't. So the climate has always changed. And that's what we, that's one of the things that we think about a lot as paleoclimatologists is what that range of natural variability in the Earth system is. The records that I'm looking at are over the last 1,000 years approximately, but stop in around 1850. So that's kind of an interesting time period because we mark that as the sort of pre-industrial cutoff. Mm-hmm. And before that, there's not very much of a signal of human influence on the climate system. Mm-hmm. And after 1850, we see more and more impact by human activity from land use change, leading to emissions of greenhouse gases, and then the Industrial Revolution with a lot of emissions of CO2, the warming of the world, leading to an increase in water vapor, and, and sort of this enhancement of the greenhouse effect that we're really seeing today. I think that my research provides a really important context for us to understand current climate change, but yeah. what I'm studying right now is kind of the, the natural climate change, if you will, and not the anthropogenic climate change that is so important for us to be addressing today. Yeah, I get that. That makes sense. That's interesting. Well, I was thinking about being an atmospheric climate scientist right now, and obviously climate change is on the forefront of the, what's being researched in climate science departments. I wanted to ask you to talk about what it's like in the field of climate science these days with the news and the information coming in constantly. How does that affect the atmosphere in your department and amongst your colleagues about how are people thinking, talking, what kind of influence does that have? Yeah, I think it's really important to talk about it. I think academia can sometimes be really slow to adjust. There's sort of traditional ways that we've studied atmospheric and climate science in the past. And I think that this is kind of a bold statement for a second year PhD student, but I think that we could do a better job as a field in terms of shifting focus. I think fundamental research is always important. It's always important to understand better how these systems work. My research is pretty, I think, fundamental. It's not super applied to understanding how anthropogenic climate change will influence my region, but I think that As a field, we could do a better job of studying some of these impacts of climate change, talking about them. But there is quite a lot being done. I was recently at a meeting in San Francisco, which is sort of the annual meeting for um, geophysical science. And there was a lot of discussion there about 
the need for scientists to be more active and how climate change is influencing the, the climate system. So I think there are more and more climate scientists who I think are are coming out and willing to be more political in their in their personal lives to talk about climate change. And I think that that is really fundamental and that's sort of what inspires me, but it would be nice to see more of that. Yeah. I'd like to see every climate scientist be a little more personal and a little more public about their understanding of the climate system and how it's changing. I think it's really important for people not to be scared of that. That ruins somehow their uh, professionalism because I think that there's not really a clear divide between the pers- personal and the professional. Yeah, I understand. Can I ask you a favor for those listeners who may not know what anthropogenic change is? Could you explain that? Yeah, certainly. Anthropogenic climate change is a kind of a phrase that attributes the current warming that we're seeing and the current changes in the climate system, which go beyond just warming, to actions taken by human society, whether that's through sort of industrial extraction of resources that releases certain gases into the atmosphere that lead to an increased warming and changes in the uh, circulation or the winds of the atmosphere, and we're seeing we're seeing a variety of climate impacts. You know, the, the oceans are warming up, becoming more acidic. And so there's all these kind of impacts in the climate system. And we can really attribute these changes to actions taken by human society and industry and sort of the, the extractive capitalistic model, I would argue, is really having a driving influence on these changes. Great. Thank you for that. Back to what we were talking before. I saw this week a Twitter post by a climate scientist, Peter Kalmus, and he said, I'm a climate scientist and I'm freaking out about what's happening to our planet right now. Mm -hmm. And that really captured me because I was wondering if that, is that the mood with among climate scientists or what do you think about that? Hmm, Yeah. Let me think of a few words I could say. I think there's this sort of high panic is something that a lot of climate scientists feel. That's that's definitely one thing. I think there's also a lot of grief and a lot of sort of really deep despair because a lot of climate scientists have seen this happening, have seen the climate changing. I was just okay. listening to a lecture by a climate scientist and he said that the previous generation of climate scientists sort of projected the changes that we're seeing now and the current generation of climate scientists has to sort of watch these things unfolding that previous generations have known was coming. And so it's this kind of despair because you're shouting from the rooftops that this thing is coming and nobody's doing anything about it. And now it's unfolding right. with even more dire consequences than was previously thought. I mean, yeah, there was reports in the 80s to, to Congress about the effects of CO2 on the atmosphere and what that would do. So it's been... You know, it's been 40 years that we've known climate change has been a big deal. And what are we doing about it? We're not really doing anything. You know, we're not doing anything serious enough. So there's that despair of watching this disaster unfold in slow motion, mm-hmm. which is just really hard to watch. There's an amazing quote by Dr. Kate Marvel, which, if you don't mind, I'd love to, to read. Please do. She says, I have no hope that these changes can be reversed. We're inevitably sending our children to live on an unfamiliar planet. But the opposite of hope is not despair, it's grief. Even while resolving to limit the damage, we can mourn. And here, the sheer scale of the problem provides a perverse comfort. We are in this together. The swiftness of the change, its scale and inevitability binds us into one, broken hearts trapped together under a warming atmosphere. We need courage, not hope. Grief, after all, is the cost of being alive. Yeah. And I think that's really profound. And to me, it's inspiring because even though there is a lot of despair, and I think a lot of people feel that, I think we need to move past despair into action and through our grief with courage into action. Thank you for that. I completely agree. And I think that's the bedrock of the Extinction Rebellion movement. And 
that's the other part of your story because you're a scientist and you're also an activist. And so I want to ask you also about that. You are an active member of Extinction Rebellion. And yeah. I wanted to ask how you came to that. Yeah, it's kind of a challenge for me. I've had some discussions with people who advocate for keeping a, a line between political commentary and activism around the same thing that you research with the argument that it's important to remain objective in the pursuit of science and knowledge. Science isn't very objective. I think that science is an activity that's done by people and people inevitably bring their own experience and opinions into the work that they do and the types of questions they ask and the perhaps even the way sometimes they approach those questions. Um, I mean, there are methods that are frequently used within a field and you can learn those and apply those and, and that can be objective, but there are other things that aren't. So I don't really think that science is a fully objective thing. And so taking that as a premise to prevent or to argue against being really active within your science, I think it's um, kind of a logical fallacy. So that's sort of where I where I stand now. But prior to coming to graduate school, I had done other types of activism work. I was pretty involved in the Occupy movement in Minnesota, where I'm originally from. And that was really inspiring to me to be able to be with people and occupy a space. I supported an occupation by the Black Lives Matter movement in front of a police station in Minnesota. So there were a few other things that I'd done in the past, but knowing about climate change, being concerned about climate change is really something I felt really motivated to participate in. And prior to coming to graduate school, I read some work by Dr. Richard Levins, who's a, a biologist and a Marxist and really a strong advocate for having a really critical perspective on the science that's being done. And a lot of his writing really inspired me to realize that it, it's not only sort of possible to be an activist and a scientist on the same topic, but especially around climate change, to me, it's almost a necessity. Prior to graduate school, in addition to thinking about if I maybe have some responsibility to be an activist as well, I learned about a group called Science for the People. Mm -hmm. And Science for the People was a group that formed in the late 80s that took kind of a radical science perspective, if you will, which was a, a critique of science and the way science was being done and some of the goals of science. And it and Richard Levins was part of this movement. And a lot of the conversations were around this concept that science isn't objective and that it's really important to be aware of maybe where your funding comes from or who who is hurt or helped by the questions you're asking and the, the results that you might have when the science, well, the, the sort of the pseudoscience of eugenics was really popular within the U.S. Science for the People had a really strong critique of that for obvious reasons. So there's been kind of a revitalization of Science for the People in the last few years. And I joined that group and I've been in conversation with people there at kind of a national level around climate change, having kind of different community forums and bringing scientists more into an activist role working in that way. And there's a new editorial that's coming out in later this year that's going to be focused on People's Green New Deal. And so that's kind of the, the climate change working groups piece of the, of the Science for the People magazine. So that'll be really exciting. And working with Science for the People for me was also really wonderful and really formative in terms of finding common ground with others who are scientists or technical folks who are also really concerned about, about the world and who are wanting to be more politically active. And so finding solidarity with other people who are wearing this hat of a scientist mm -hmm. and also this hat of an activist, and yeah. it's been really great. One other person that inspired me to want to be more of an activist in my science is Dr. James Hansen, who was arrested in 2013 in protest of the Keystone XL pipeline. And to me, as a young scientist, having these examples of older scientists who are more advanced in their field that aren't afraid of speaking out. Right now, for example, there's an environmental scientist uh, whose name is Professor Nathan Phillips from Boston University. 
and he's on a hunger strike in protest. There are some trucks that are carrying arsenic containing materials that aren't being properly disposed of. And Peter Kalmas, who's pretty vocal and is working with scientists for the Sunrise Movement who've endorsed Bernie Sanders. So th there's a lot of examples of these scientists who've kind of come out to be more political. Kate Marvel talks a lot about science communication. These are examples that for me are really affirming of the work that I'm doing as a scientist. And so mm -hmm. it's been kind of a challenge to think about those two things and how public I am within my own department, but I feel it's really important, especially now. So you feel in some ways a responsibility to be vocal given your, you know, status as a scientist that it gives you, you know, the capacity to have a louder voice or to have more impact? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it's really important also to remember that I'm, for, for me and for people that I talk to, for them to know that I'm, I'm a scientist and I have a lot of knowledge about this area, but I'm also a citizen. I'm also somebody who might want to be a mother someday. I'm also a voter. I'm also someone who pays taxes. I breathe air. I drink water. Mm -hmm. And so these really human qualities that I have also call me to be an activist around this topic. But I do feel that I'm, I somehow have more of a voice and a platform and a little bit of a, a cachet as a scientist who studies climate yeah. that I can articulate some of the changes that are happening and communicate that to people. I think there's a real desire for knowledge, but there's also kind of a fallacy to say that there's this information deficit and that if people just know more, they'll take action. Because like I was saying, we've known for 40 years that climate yeah. change is going to be a really big problem and yeah. we haven't taken action. So right. I think that we need to kind of move beyond, move beyond just the information deficit. So yeah. I feel my training gives me some of the knowledge that I can share, but really it's, it's me as a person who's concerned about climate change. That is what makes me feel like I can do activism. Um, I, I'm not a policy expert. I'm, I don't know very much about health. I don't know a lot about immigration and international agreements and international law. And I think Sometimes scientists are asked to not only talk about climate change, but to talk about what we should do about climate change. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what we should do, <laughs> so but I know we should do something. Yeah, I think that also brings me back to why I really believe in XR and XR's work and demands, because I think it's really it's about pushing for change from from the people that have the knowledge to make those changes. And so I, I think that's really I think that's part of what makes XR really great. I wanted to just circle back to what we were talking about a minute ago about Extinction Rebellion. I was wondering when you got involved with XR, was there something about the demands or the principles that Ex Extinction Rebellion is based on that drew you in that direction? Yeah, definitely. I think the second demand for me was really the the key piece, act as though the truth is real. I think XR is living up to that by performing activism that is sort of at the scale of the crisis. I think doing arrestable actions is, is a really key thing in terms of elevating the stakes for activists and for the politicians that demands urgent action. I think we'll see more of that, more escalation of tactics by activists and probably by police as climate change becomes uh, more obviously about life and death for more people. It is today for sure, but it will continue to be more and more in the future as climate change continues to undermine national security and social order. I think that I think that we're going to see increased escalation of people who are gripping onto the status quo and also demanding that change at a really rapid pace. I think that that's kind of inevitable, but I think XR is sort of the first group that's that's really moving in that direction from uh, an activist standpoint. And to me, that was really thoroughly motivating in terms of joining XR. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece. The other piece is the regenerative culture that Extinction Rebellion has. 
I've given the Headed for Extinction talk, which is this sort of key piece of growing the movement a few times, and I've attended it a number of times as well from other people within the Capital Region group where I am. And every time I hear it, it's it, it cuts a little bit deeper. It's sort of a, mm-hmm. I have a deeper understanding of the crisis, a deeper understanding of what's at stake. And it it's more emotional every time for me. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that's important. Sort of as a scientist, when I'm studying climate change, I don't have a lot of discussion around the influence of climate change. Even though I'm studying rainfall, I don't think a lot about how extreme rainfall might really impact people. Mm-hmm. When I'm with Extinction Rebellion and I'm listening to the talk and I'm thinking about the climate science, maybe from a different lens, it it really comes sort of to to a head what really is at stake. And so mm-hmm. I think that Extinction Rebellion is really has really been helpful for me in terms of understanding and integrating all of the science as into the into kind of a nice little package of what the climate crisis is really about. And then having that regenerative culture piece that allows not only that full recognition, but whatever kind of emotional response that you have from recognition of the crisis to give you a place to process that and also through which to put that emotion into action through some nonviolent direct action that's being taken. I think I think all of those pieces really tie together well. Uh, yeah, that's really well said. From that, it's making me wonder if you feel that this is missing from the dialogue and academic programs, a focus on ethics and responsibility or action or taking the science and putting it into the world. Yeah, I think a lot of climate scientists aren't thinking about it. I would love to be wrong about that, but I don't think so. I think... Mm -hmm. That, but I'm not sure if that is something that should be in academic programs. I haven't thought about that too much, actually. Mm-hmm. I think it's a personal choice. I think that to be uh, to be effective, I think you need to have a personal motivation. I don't think it's hard to find a personal motivation to be interested in stopping climate change from mm-hmm. wreaking havoc on our natural yeah. and human systems. I think that's pretty obvious to most people if you if you think about it for a little bit i think as climate scientists we have a collective responsibility but maybe not a responsibility that is carried by each person i think there's a role for our community to be talking about climate science to be talking about the need for action but again we're not we're not policymakers right. and not economists and so i think that there shouldn't be that burden on climate scientists to be doing that work. I don't think that there should be more of a burden on climate scientists to talk about ethics than any other discipline. But I think that there's a place for that conversation within academia, for sure. Yeah. I'm not sure what that would look like. Yeah, yeah that, you put that well. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about the burden on climate scientists to have all the answers, and that must be an uncomfortable position to be in. I know. You've done such a good job at articulating all of this. I, I'm really impressed. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to have a chance to, to talk with someone about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of a particular situation. Yeah, I know. It's Um, very unique and very special what you can bring together from different parts of your life and really make that holistic. That must really help you, as we say, that action is the antidote to despair. So you've been able to experience the grief and the emotion and put that into action. What I'm hearing is that that's a way of integrating that's working for you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I've found within Extinction Rebellion in in my region, there are other folks who have the scientific formation in their background. And that's been really great to find that camaraderie in that way. It's why we want to talk with you, because you have this unique position of being both a scientist and an activist. And so this has been such a fascinating conversation 
Thank you. I so appreciate That's it. That's great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hope more scientists continue to come forward um, to be really vocal about what they know and what they're concerned about and um, to be okay with uncertainty and to, um, and to communicate that. Yeah, and I think that's actually a really important point also because we understand there is no certainty. We don't know the extent of climate change yet. We know it's happening. We just don't know exactly what it's going to look like. We don't know the, the speed. We don't know the time frame. We know it's happening, and we know that if we don't make urgent changes, immediate changes, it's going to be worse. But there still are some question marks. So I can see why that prevents scientists from taking a stand or how it might, but yeah. Certainly, yeah, that can be challenging. Yeah. Certainly. I, sometimes I feel the voice that I have is a voice that's maybe a little more reined in um, because I'm studying variability. I, I think about how there's really natural fluctuations and that extreme events are a part of the natural cycle. And so if there's a hurricane that's hitting New York, like Hurricane Sandy, how extreme is that? How much is, is that particular event a direct result of climate change? Probably, probably not, right? Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't know enough about the history of hurricanes to know what a particular event is or is not um, a result of climate change. Now, was it made more likely because of global warming? Probably. Mm -hmm. But to make these really clear statements is really a challenge. And so there's a communication difficulty there. And climate scientists are also not trained to be communicators to non-scientific audiences. Yeah. So if anything, I would say that that's something that we should be more trained in. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense uh, to me. But it's, I think it's important to try and to be humble. And yeah, <laughs> it's challenging. Thank you so much, Rebecca. This has been a very enlightening conversation. So thank you for taking your time to do this. Thank you, too. Your precious time. It's been time. a pleasure. Thanks. This podcast has been a production of Extinction Rebellion New York City. We have no advertisers. We are volunteers fueled by love and rage. If you would like more information about Extinction Rebellion, please go to xrebellion.nyc. That website address is in the show notes for this episode. Thanks for listening and see you in the streets.